Good evening and welcome one and all. My name is James Vitali and I'm the Executive Officer of the Cambridge Union. For tonight's event, we've collaborated with the Centre for Geopolitics here in Cambridge to bring General McMaster to the Union. As usual, you can submit questions if you want uh, to ask them this evening via the Google form in the comments section on the YouTube, YouTube page below. I will introduce our interviewer for this evening, who is Professor Brendan Sims. Brendan is Professor of the History of International Relations at the University and the Director of the Centre for Geopolitics think tank Cambridge. He has authored a number of excellent books, including Three Victories and a Defeat, Europe, The Struggle for Supremacy, Britain's Europe, and more recently, a new biography on Hitler. Brendan, I shall leave you to take it away. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor uh, to introduce General H.R. McMaster. Um, the fact that he served for some two years as National Security Advisor to President Donald J. Trump, of course, is well known. In that capacity, he dealt with some of the thorniest issues uh, in global politics, such as the nuclear threat uh, from Iran, um, the war in Afghanistan, uh, and the Iran deal. This is the uh, subject, among other things, of his memoir, Battlegrounds, which I hold up, uh, and which he will be uh, speaking to me about uh, this evening. Now, before that, General McMaster was a serving soldier, uh, seeing active duty in both Gulf Wars, among other things. What is perhaps less well known uh, is that he is also an accomplished historian. Uh, about 25 years ago, he wrote a book on the uh, failures of the US military uh, in Vietnam called Dereliction of Duty, which I also hold up and very much recommend uh, to you. Um, and this is a book which is still very highly regarded uh, by historians uh, of the Vietnam War. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to put particular emphasis on this historical dimension in the last third or so uh, of our conversation. Uh, I hope also that we'll be able to steer clear a little bit um, of the surface turbulence and of personalities uh, in this discussion uh, and to focus a bit more uh, on the deeper structures. But of course, um, H.R. McMaster was there uh, and I'm sure he will uh, let us know uh, about uh, some of that color uh, as well. So, um, General McMaster will now speak for about eight minutes uh, to his book, um, after which uh, we will have a discussion. Brendan, thank you. Thanks for the privilege of being with you. My thanks to James as well. I think the Union is just such a, a wonderful tradition and a wonderful service, and, and it's a real privilege to, to join such a distinguished scholar for a meaningful, thoughtful discussion of the challenges we face internationally. I think we need more of that these days. And, and the, one of the reasons I wrote the book, I, I, maybe quite predictably as a military officer, I made a mission statement for myself in my, in my second career. And it was to try to contribute to, to a better understanding, a more full understanding of the challenges and opportunities that we face internationally as a way to maybe help reverse some of the polarization we see in our societies and to allow us to work together to build a better future for, for generations to come. And so the book fits into that overall mission statement and I, I thought what I might share with you is, is, is what was on my mind as I started as National Security Advisor on my first day, having received quite unexpectedly a, a phone call from Washington when I was walking down Walnut Street in Philadelphia, my, my hometown, on the way to a small but mighty think tank that also focuses on geopolitics, the Foreign Policy Research Institute, to, to, to deliver the results of a study that I commissioned 18 months earlier on Russian new generation warfare. My job at the time was to design the future army. And it was my, my thought that it, it's, it, we, ought to, we would do well to study a, a recent conflict in Russia's use of disruptive technologies and, and combinations of, of conventional and unconventional forces to accomplish objectives below the threshold of what might elicit a concerted response uh, from, from NATO and, 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 uh, and, and other, uh, other nations, the United States in particular, I think. And, and uh, and, 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 and my phone rang, and, and it was, it was uh, an invitation to go to Mar-a-Lago to, to, uh, to interview uh, with uh, someone I'd never met, uh, President Trump, for the job of National Security Advisor. And that interview was on a Sunday. There was a following uh, interview on, on, uh, on Monday, and he hired me. Uh, and I flew back on Air Force One to Washington. I didn't even live in Washington, so they had aircraft there waiting to fly me back to my home in Southern Virginia, Tidewater, Virginia, where I packed a bag 
And I reported to work the next day. I walked into the West Wing of the White House. So not a whole heck of a lot of time, Brendan, to prepare uh, for, for the job. But what I had is this great gift, this great gift of having been afforded the opportunity it, it, while still an active duty officer to, to, to study and read and research and, and write history and then to teach history at West Point and oftentimes to, in many of those lessons to teach the national security decision making process and policy making process. And of course, I, I, I researched in depth the decisions that transformed our involvement in Vietnam, as you mentioned, into a, an American war. So as, as a historian now with, with, uh, responsible uh, for that uh, national security decision-making process, I, I resolved to at least not make the same mistakes. And what I endeavored to do is to, uh, is to ensure that we, we tried to understand the complex challenges that we faced before rushing to action. This was a problem in, in, in the lead up to the Vietnam period. So we put into place uh, what we called a principal small group framing sessions to apply design thinking, to ask first order questions as a historian might uh, before rushing in, into action. And, and in particular, we were questioning really the, the, the assumptions that had underpinned US foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. And these were three, I think, mutually reinforcing assumptions. First of all, flushed with really the twin victories of, uh, of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the, the parting of the, the Iron Curtain, uh, and in combination with the overwhelming military victory in the Gulf War, just about 30 years ago to the date uh, today, uh, we, we believed, I, I think, it generated a period of, of overconfidence, overconfidence based on these three assumptions. The first of which was that, 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 um, that an arc of history had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. A, a related assumption uh, that, that great power rivalry was, was, a, was a relic of the past. And third, that the technological military prowess that the U.S. military and the U.K. military and, and others d d demonstrated during the Gulf War would guarantee our security well into the future. And you might remember some of the language associated with the orthodoxy of the revolution in military affairs, for example, right? Everything, every other sentence had the word dominant in it. And, and, uh, and so we, we forgot really the enduring nature of war, and we were seized with what we believed were fundamental shifts in, in the character of warfare, shifts that we believe would make future war fast, cheap, and, and efficient. And so I believe that these assumptions, they were a setup. They were a setup for frustrations and disappointments in the 2000s, beginning, of course, uh, with the most destructive terrorist attack in, in, in history on September 11th, 2001, when terrorists used box cutters and, and airplanes to bypass our technological military prowess and, and, and murder uh, nearly 3,000 innocents. Then, of course, we had the unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And we often want to debate, and I'm sure this has happened at the Union, uh, wh whether we should have done it, it being the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I think what we ought to debate is who the heck thought it would be easy and why did they think it would be easy? Uh, and, and, then, and then, of course, we had, uh, we had the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, and, and I think it was at this time that the pendulum swung, the, the pendulum of, the, of sort of the emotional impetus behind foreign policy and national security from over-optimism and a touch of hubris to, 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 uh, to over-pessimism, I think, and, and resignation. And so I think if the 2003 invasion of Iraq typifies overconfidence and an associated underappreciation of the risks and costs of action, then I think that the complete withdrawal from Iraq in December 2001, when then Vice President Biden calls President Obama up and says, thank you for allowing me to end this goddamn war, uh, I think also de demonstrates uh, the, the underappreciation of the risks and costs of inaction or disengagement, much like the unenforced red line in Syria in 2013 after the Assad regime commits mass murder of innocent civilians uh, with nerve agent. Um, or I think maybe even in Libya, right, where we, we helped uh, rebels unseat Gaddafi, but then did nothing uh, to, to, shape, uh, to shape the political landscape uh, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Gaddafi regime. So, Brandon, I think just by way of introduction, what, what, I, what I might do then is, is highlight the continuities that we neglected in the nature of war. 
uh, because I think it's important for especially historians <laughs> to continue to sensitize uh, our, our, our fellow citizens to the importance of understanding how at least the recent past produced the present as the first step toward making a projection into the future. And to keep in mind the words of the, the great American historian Carl Becker, spoken in the 1930s at a, in a speech before the American Historical Association, in which he said something like, the memory of the past and anticipation of the future have to ha walk hand in hand in a happy way, without one disputing privacy over the other. And I think whenever, whenever we become enamored with change and neglect continuity, we set ourselves up uh, for disappointments. And, and so in, in particular, we, we neglected that war is an extension of politics. Okay, well, of course, everybody knows that because Carl von Clausewitz said that, but what that means is, is that the consolidation of military gains to get to a political outcome, that's not an optional phase of war unless you're just conducting a raid. We also neglected that war is profoundly human and that people fight for the same reasons Thucydides identified 2,500 years ago, fear, honor, and, and interest. And if, we, and if we're not addressing those drivers of conflict, we're treating over, or only the symptoms. And I'm thinking now, of course, of, of raids against nodes and terrorist organizations w without due attention to, to, to what is causing jihadist terrorism in, in the first place. The third, the third is that war is uncertain. War is, is indeed a, a continuous interaction of opposites. And so the future course of events in war, of course, depends not just on what we decide to do, but on, on initiatives and actions of our adversaries. And, and uh, this is why war is inherently nonlinear. This is why it is, it is silly of us, as we have, have become accustomed to doing now, uh, to, to announcing years in advance exactly the number of troops we're gonna have, what they're gonna do, what they're not gonna do uh, in particular conflicts. And, the, and then, war, and then war, is, war is profoundly uh, a contest of wills. And if you just think about the, 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 the horrible uh, policy that we've put in place, the, this, uh, this fundamentally flawed and self-delusional, de really, uh, uh, peace agreement with the Taliban in Afghanistan. It's, a, it's a, an example of forgetting uh, that prevailing in war means convincing your enemy that your enemy's been defeated, or at least in this case, I think, that they cannot accomplish their objectives uh, through, through the use of force. So I was determined as I took the job not to, not to repeat these kind of uh, these mistakes, uh, to, to, to frame complex problems, to be mindful of continuity as well as change uh, in this framing process to try to establish clear objectives and overarching goals uh, for policies and strategies such as our approach to China, which I imagine we'll talk a bit about. Uh, that You can see that in the, in the declassified Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the framework document for a series of, of more, uh, more specific strategies and, and plans. Uh, and, and, then, and then also I was determined to present the a president the president with multiple options, because it is only in the presentation of those options and the comparison of them that you can you can highlight long term costs and, and, and consequences and risks and so forth. And then and then finally, I endeavored as best I could uh, to to insulate our policy making and and decision making process from partisan politics uh, under the belief that those who will want to weigh in on, on those considerations will have a voice with the president in any way. Uh, but I found that in Vietnam, when Lyndon Johnson was making decisions based primarily on his domestic political goals and priorities, getting elected in 1964, passing the Great Society legislation in 1965, and viewing Vietnam principally as a danger to those goals, uh, that is what uh, allowed, I, I think, the escalation of the war, the Americanization of war, of the war without a strategy uh, and without any really due consideration of the long-term costs and consequences. So, hey, I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And you've, as it were, dived into the material. And, and why don't we start with um, one of the aspects you've already opened up, which is the, the question of options. Uh, I mean, your book, uh, the first main uh, text chapter is on Russia. Um, and you make a very strong case for the strategic challenge that is posed by Vladimir Putin across all kinds of fronts, which you might elaborate in a minute. But um, at the same time, the principal competitor of the United States and, and if you like, the Western free world uh, in your account is very much uh, the PRC. And I suppose so the question would be in terms of the options, uh, this didn't really come across in the book. Uh, was there ever a sort of a choice in your mind 
between, as it were, conciliating uh, the Russians in order to, to win them over for the bigger struggle against the, the PRC. You know, I, I, I think so, and it was tried, I think, across, uh, across the two administrations, the George W. Bush administration, as well as the Barack Obama administration. And what we tried to do as we, as we frame these challenges is to really understand better what drives and constrains the other, especially our rivals or, and, and, our, and our adversaries. And, and again, to, to, to make uh, explicit what are typically implicit assumptions that, under, that undermine or that underpin uh, policy. And with, with Putin, uh, we concluded that, that really Putin is driven, driven by fear, fear of losing control, right? Fear of a color revolution coming, coming to, to Russia, fear that, that this, this protection racket that he has set up with him at the top of it, that you might, might collapse and he'll lose power uh, that way. Uh, and then also he's driven by a sense of honor lost after the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. So he is driven, as he said he was in, two, in the year 2000, uh, that he's driven uh, to, to restore Russia to national greatness. He's also cognizant, though, uh, of, of limitations in his power, especially economic uh, resources available. His economy is about the size of Italy's or, or Texas's economy. And so the, Putin's theory of victory is to drag everybody else down under the theory that he can be the last man standing. And, and, and part of this uh, effort is, is, of course, the sustained campaign of cyber-enabled information warfare and, uh, and, and in an effort to, to polarize us, whether it's on issues of, of Brexit, for example, in the UK, or in the United States, issues of race, uh, or of gun control or immigration. Uh, but what he really hopes to do is to diminish our confidence, confidence in our common identity, common identity across the Atlantic in, in terms of the transatlantic relationship and alliance within NATO, but, but a common identity within each of our nations as well, polarize our polities, pit us against each other, and diminish our confidence in our democratic institutions and, and, and processes. And, you know, he's, I think he's, he feels as if he's being pretty successful these days, uh, largely because of what we've inflicted on ourselves. Uh, in the United States in particular, this, this, uh, you know, we had the, the extreme case of the President of the United States uh, uh, perpetuating, uh, amplifying uh, unfounded conspiracy theories and, and allegations of widespread fraud in the election. And then, then actually encouraging an assault on the first branch of, of government, on the Congress. And so uh, Putin doesn't have to do a lot of work you know, when, we're, when, we're, uh, when we're our own worst enemies. So, the, so what I recommend in the, in the book is, is a bit of introspection, right, to bolster our confidence, to, to use strategic empathy, first of all, to understand what drives and constrains the other, but then to make a concerted effort uh, to, to build or bolster our, our own confidence and, and to counter really what is a sustained campaign of political subversion against us. So, I mean, you've made very clear, both in the book and your remarks, just now, the, the importance of keeping uh, partisan politics out of foreign policy uh, and also preventing uh, hostile actors from using, as you've just shown, uh, these partisan politics to undermine the United States and, and, and the Western world. But there's an audience question which I think is very relevant here. Um, and the viewer asks whether, isn't there then also a danger of insulating foreign policy from democratic politics itself? How do you sort of negotiate um, this, that, that you make sure that you're not dragged into partisan politics, but you maintain the democratic connection and, and um, legitimation? Right. Well, I think it's really important to understand that, that you, you get the foreign policy, you get the defense policy, the national security strategy, that, that, the, that in, our, in our case, the American public will support, right? And, and so I think it's immensely important, uh, you know, not only... Uh, to, 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 to run this policy process uh, to get what you would, you would hope would be the best possible decision, but also to communicate to the American people and to communicate really two aspects of every one of these challenges. The first of these is, so what? Why do Americans care about this? So essentially, what is at stake? And the second 
a very important element of communicating to the American people is what is the policy and strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome at an acceptable cost and risk? I don't think our leaders have done that very effectively. I think as a, as a national security advisor, you can help a president do that. National security advisors, I'll just say quickly, I think have to, have to, have to uh, accomplish five key tasks uh, effectively to, to do a good job in serving any president and serving the Constitution. The first of these is to staff the president. That is to, to help the president engage on foreign policy and national security in a meaningful way with foreign leaders, foreign fo leader phone calls, uh, engagements with, with members of Congress, for example. The, the, the second of, the, of, of these uh, key tasks is to run that process, run that process that delivers multiple options to the president, help the president make decisions, and then assist with the sensible and integrated implementation of those decisions and policies. The third is to communicate. So every time we had a, a, a policy shift, we tried to have a public facing event and a speech to communicate the nature of that, uh, of that policy to, and strategy to the, to the American people. Uh, the South Asia uh, speech that, that President Trump gave in August 2017, I think is a prime example of that. There are many, many others as well. I think the, uh, the Iran speech in September or October of that same year. And then the fourth key, key task is to try to achieve unity of effort with like-minded partners internationally, especially with our, our closest allies. And that's your national security advisor, national security advisor relationship. And then finally, you know, you have to lead an organization. You have a, you have a highly talented and motivated National Security Council staff. And you have to provide them with what we call in the military purpose, motivation, and direction. And so, and so, and, 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 uh, and so I, I think that the communication part of the, this is immensely important, especially for the president. And I'll also say that an important way to engage the American people uh, in, in policymaking and decision making is through the, the representatives in Congress. Mainly the secretaries in our departments, you know, your equivalent of your ministers will do, would do this because our, you know, our Congress has oversight over those departments and agencies. So the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense should be constantly engaging uh, with members of Congress. But as a National Security Advisor, I on occasion convened bipartisan groups of, of, of senators and congressmen, first of all, in the framing process, to listen to them. What do you think it, it, it ought to be our objectives in connection with the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party? Where do you think are the greatest areas of risk and danger? What are the greatest opportunities? And then we incorporated their views into the, the development of the policy. Because one of the key aspects of strategic competence I think for, for our democratic nations is to have a, a consistent long-term approach to foreign policy. I think we've, we've got in recent years into this habit of new administrations defining their foreign policy, mainly you know, in, in, as in, in opposition to the administration that went before that. I think we're seeing a kind of a shift in that now, a positive one with the Biden administration's approach to China, uh, for, for example. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. It, this is not an insulated or insular process uh, in, in connection with involving the American people and their representatives in Congress. Can you say a little bit more about how you see the Biden administration's policy uh, on China uh, in relation to, to, to the one that you and, and your successors pursued? You, you sounded just now quite optimistic that he- Well, would, you know, I, I, am, I am optimistic. I am optimistic, uh, friend. I, mean, I think that we will see a, a very high degree of continuity. And, and the reason is, I think, as we were laying the, the groundwork for, I think, the most significant shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, by the way, the approach to China, the shift from, and these terms are only of limited utility, obviously, but just, just to, to summarize quickly, the shift from, from cooperation and engagement with China to, to competition, transparent competition uh, with, with, with China in the, in the, under the recognition that the Chinese Communist Party, uh, again, was driven by, is driven by emotion and ideology, primarily. Uh, the, the emotion is fear, uh, uh, fear of, of losing uh, its exclusive grip on power. Uh, that's tied as well uh, to the nationalist, uh, nationalistic agenda um, of, of uh, achieving national rejuvenation externally is to, that's tied to the, to the party's you know, fundamental desire to maintain its exclusive grip on power 
uh, in internally. Uh, and, and the, and the ideology of the, of the Chinese Communist Party, which, which sees itself uh, at, at the center, uh, in, in, in the Eurasian landmass in particular, uh, and, and, and drives th this external effort to achieve exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific and then to challenge uh, the United States, the UK, the EU, you know, internationally, and to promote really a, a, an authoritarian mercantilist system uh, that, that is in direct competition with our, with our free and open systems and, uh, and if China succeeds, the stakes are quite high, I believe, because the world would be less free, less prosperous, and, and less safe. So that's, that's the assessment that, that we made. And, and we came to this conclusion <laughs> um, in, in a way that, uh, that, that was bipartisan. We engaged uh, members of both political parties in, 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 in affecting this, this shift in our policy and in our strategy. And I, I think what helped tremendously is, is Xi Jinping the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, I, I think it's really important for us to understand that the principal driver of continuity in U.S. policy, and I think, I think the U.K. is kind of uh, alongside us, despite the prime minister's um, uh, the, the equivocation a bit in the, in the speech uh, yesterday. Um, you know, I, I think that, that, uh, that, that uh, Europe is, is a little bit behind, but heading in the same direction. I think Japan is with us, India, Australia, uh, thanks to the, the actions of, of Xi Jinping and, and, uh, and the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, if you just think about it, Brennan, I mean, this is not an issue, obviously, between Washington and, and Beijing. Uh, this is an, an issue of, of sovereignty versus servitude. And if you look at the actions of the party, you know, foisting COVID-19 on the world, uh, really going after and punishing anyone who's trying to ring the alarm bell about human-to-human -human transmission, whether it was investigative journalists or the or doctors them, themselves, adding insult to injury with wolf warrior diplomacy, becoming much more aggressive internationally, bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier, extending the party's repressive arm in, into, into Hong Kong, and now, of course, the mass arrests of, of recent weeks, the increasing aggression in the South China Sea, telling their Coast Guard, hey, fire on vessels that don't acknowledge what would be the largest land grab, so to speak, in, in, in history. Uh, the the uh, aggressive actions toward Taiwan, uh, massive cyber attacks against our medical research facilities in the midst of a pandemic, and then this this really concerted campaign of economic coercion on Australia, right, in an effort to kill one to scare a uh, hundred. Not to mention slow genocide, right, in, in Xinjiang. Okay, so okay, tell me again. How this is, did, did, I mean, Donald Trump, some people might think he was a pretty mean person, but I don't think he caused all that. So I, I think that, that, uh, that the pendulum is swinging quite dramatically uh, you know, against this kind of, this kind of brazen aggression uh, at our expense and at the, at the expense of the, of the rights of the Chinese people. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're going to see a high degree of international cooperation. If you just look at the statement, the joint statement from the uh, from the the uh, the Quad meeting uh, just in the last few days, uh, and the joint statement between the the and the U.S. Japan uh, meeting yesterday, they're quite they're quite strong, you know, and and I think there'll be a, a big element of continuity uh, between the Trump uh, policy on China, Trump administration policy, and the Biden administration policy. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Secretary Blinken has been quite strong on on all this. Uh, so has uh, the National Security Advisor and the President himself. It, what's your expectation in the event of a, a PRC attempt to cross the Taiwan Strait? Do, do you no. think the Biden administration would intervene and would a Trump administration have done so? Well, you know, there, there is this policy, right, of strategic ambiguity. Uh, I think maybe for, for good reason, right? We, we want the, the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist Party to have doubts about it. Well, I mean, they should have doubts <laughs> about it because th there have been uh, you know, several uh, Taiwan Strait crises, and the U.S. has intervened in every one of them, right? There's no reason, I don't think, to believe that the United States wouldn't respond again. And, and I think that the, the, the Chinese Communist Party would, would uh, uh, if it made a decision uh, to try to, uh, to, to, try to uh, um, you know, force uh, reunification uh, with, uh, militarily, uh, that it would set it, it, itself up, I think, for, uh, for devastating losses. Um, remember, this was the same, the, same, you know, the same mistake made by, you know, by, by, uh, 
uh, by the North Koreans in, 19, in June of 1950, right? The belief that there, there would not be an intervention. We still have, the United States has considerable military power there. And I think what's most important is that, that Taiwan, under President Tsai Ing-wen, is, is undertaking a, a pretty ambitious reform effort within their own national defense uh, structure uh, and, and, um, and, and is developing capabilities, I, I think, that are immensely important to deterrence by denial, right? which is essentially what's necessary is for Taiwan itself, mainly, to convince the PLA that it could not accomplish mm-hmm. its objectives in Taiwan uh, at an acceptable cost. So a final question on, on the PRC for now. Um, I mean, you mentioned the RMA, the Revolution of Military Affairs, earlier. Uh, and the way in which that had sort of cast a, basically had, you know, imposed an intellectual block in thinking about war. Now, of course, to some extent, uh, the boot is, a, is on the other foot in the sense that the PRC has undergone, as you know, considerable military modernization. Um, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Casey Lynn, who's the deputy director of the Center for Geopolitics, is wondering whether the U.S. is, is, is now, as it were, alert, just as China or the PRC learned uh, after the Gulf War, is the US now learning militarily uh, from, from the PRC? And if so, whether that is necessarily the right way to go uh, yeah. for a democratic power? Right. Well, you know, this is what's really important, I think, to recognize is that, that in, inside of war, you interact with, with enemies. In between wars, you interact with adversaries. This is why the orthodoxy of the RMA was fundamentally flawed. Uh, much of it was based on this idea of a leap ahead capability, right? We would, would just leap ahead to, to back then to 2025 or now to 2040. And we'll build the idealized you know, uh, you know, military that, that we're envisioning. And, and it will, you know, in the language of the time of the 90s, we thought that, we, that those investments would actually lock out our competitors out of the market of, of future armed conflict. Mm. And think about hu- how hubristic that is, right? Mm. I mean, so in, in war, there are always countermeasures, always countermeasures, right? There's the submarine, the sonar, the bomber, the radar, the machine gun, the tank, the tank, the anti-tank missile. And now I think what we're seeing are countermeasures to the exquisite uh, networked precision strike capabilities that our advanced military has brought to battlefields like Iraq in, in 1991, when we, when we devastated you know, the fourth largest army in the world. People learned vicariously from that, from, from that experience, right? The, the Chinese and, and the Russians in particular. There are two fundamental ways to fight, asymmetrically and stupidly, right? And you hope that your enemy picks stupidly, but they're unlikely to do it. And China has not picked stupidly in terms of the capabilities they developed. So we're relying on space assets. China's developed counter space capabilities. We're reliant on assured communications. China has invested heavily in offensive cyber and electronic warfare capabilities. We have exquisite stealth capabilities. China has invested in tiered and layered air defense and new forms of of being able to to acquire targets. Uh, We have a tremendous surface naval capability as well as an air force capability. So China is heavily invested in missiles as a counter to that. So I could go on about this. We're also investing in, in swarm technologies with unmanned aerial systems and unmanned, uh, unmanned uh, subsurface systems. So what do we do? Well, you develop countermeasures to the countermeasures. Right? And, and also, I think what's most important is we need defense capabilities that, like, hopefully, as we are, Brendan, in our, at our age, that, that degrade gracefully rather than fail catastrophically. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and are resilient. And, and forces that are capable of highly decentralized operations and, and innovation and execution on the fly. Now, I, I could go on about some of the more of the characteristics of these forces. I think they have to be forward positioned because China and Russia are trying to develop uh, you know, what, what is called denied space. Well, if you have forward position forces that are capable, coalition and, and allied forces, you automatically transform that to denied space into contested space from the beginning. Uh, and and I, I'm afraid that what we're doing, though, if from a defense perspective, is is doubling down on investments in more and fewer and fewer, more and more exquisite systems that are more expensive and that could put us on a path to maybe exquisite irrelevance. So I, I, there's there's a, a good book here uh, published uh, here in the U.S. Um, called The Kill Chain by Christian Bros. 
I, I recommend it. I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to his arguments in, in that book that we need, we need, we actually, we, we need forces that maybe are larger in scale now uh, and, and that are more resilient and, and can, can operate in a degraded uh, mode. So taking a step back and looking at, as it were, the big picture of the administration, I mean, you're very critical in your book of President Trump in many respects for his actions. Uh, and of course you have been since. Um, at the same time, clearly you, you are carrying out um, his policy. Um, and the question I have at this stage is, how should we regard uh, President Trump as a strategist? I mean, did, did he have a coherent worldview or was it just as his critics would claim, sort of a grab bag of different instincts and prejudices? What, what's your sense from your prolonged engagement with him? Well, you know, President Trump tapped into a sentiment in, in the United States in, in which many citizens believed that government had failed them, right? That the government had disappointed them in connection with uh, economic growth and economic opportunity. This was due in large measure to transitions in the global economy in the 1990s, accelerated after China's accession into the World Trade Organization in 2001. You, know, you add on to that, you know, the domestic effects of, of the financial crisis, put it, you know, throw an opioid crisis right on top of that. Mm -hmm. And there was a high degree of disenchantment uh, on, in these matters and then on foreign policy as well, right? The, again, this unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so President Trump was, was elected as a contrarian, as someone who was going to reject uh, the conventional wisdom associated with, you know, the foreign policy and national security elites in Washington who were seen as part of the problem. And he campaigned against, you know, against uh, the, the foreign policy elites. And so I would say he brought it with him an inclination toward reflexive uh, contrarianism you know, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and a, I think initially a, a healthy uh, kind of uh, penchant for questioning the assumptions on which previous policies were based. And, you know, uh, Brendan, I was only there for 13 months, right, from, from February of 2017 to March of 2018. And I saw it as my job uh, not to tell the president what he wanted to hear, right? Not, not to tell him that he was right on in, in connection with all of his predilections and inclinations and instincts, uh, but to get him access to the best advice, the best analysis from across all of our departments and agencies from the private sector, from academia as well, uh, and to help him make uh, dis the best decisions. This is why I did insist on presenting multiple options to him. First of all, <laughs> that was the practical way to, 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 uh, uh, to interact with, with, uh, with really any president, I think, but with, with President Trump in particular, because he's the sort of person that if you brought you know, one course of action and said, hey, everybody agrees on this. This is what you should do. I mean, he's, he's the type of person who would do the opposite just to spite everybody almost, you know. So I, it was important to show him first, maybe, hey, here's what I think you, you're already predisposed toward wanting to do, but here's what it looks like in terms of the costs and consequences. If your objectives are, and list the objectives that were previously agreed, then you might consider these other courses of action uh, as well. And I'll tell you, when we did that, Brendan, we got, I think, extremely good policy outcomes. But I say good for the country, good for you know, humanity, uh, our allies and partners and so forth. Uh, but in the process of doing that, uh, I believe that I personally got used up in the position, yeah. right? Because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't giving him the, the advice he wanted to hear. And by the way, uh, we were running a process that was effective. And there were some people... In that White House, I think in any White House, in any administration, uh, who don't want that process to run well because they don't want to give the president multiple options. They want instead to manipulate decisions consistent with their agenda, right, on you know, trade or immigration or, what, or whatever it is. So, you know, I knew I had a shelf life. I was at peace with that. I mean, this was a bonus round for me in my 34th year of, of service as an active duty officer. Um, but I, I think it's, it's immensely important for a national security advisor to, to not tell the president what the president wants. This is what McGeorge Bundy, my, <laughs> my predecessor in that job during, in the period during which uh, Vietnam became an American war. Um, I think this is one of the mistakes that he made. And it's one of the, you know, one of the resolutions I made when I came into the job. Many of, of Lyndon Johnson's advisors that concluded 
that to maintain their influence with the president, they had to tell the president only what the president wanted to hear. Well, of course, this begs the question, Brandon, like what, what the heck good is your influence anyway, right? So, so I, I think, um, I think you, it would have been a disservice to you know, President Trump or really to any president to not present multiple options and, and, uh, and, and to present analysis and, and recommendations that ran counter uh, to the president's initial instincts or, or, and predilections. So it's you know, I would point again, Brandon, just quickly, I would point again to that speech he gave in August of 2017, because you know, we prepared the speech for him announcing the South Asia strategy. And this, of course, includes the, our, our efforts in, in Afghanistan. And he wrote, you know, in this big marker that he would always edit <laughs> documents with, you know, this is not the decision I thought I would make. But when I sat behind the, the desk in the Oval Office and viewed it from, from a different perspective, I concluded that. So you know, that, that's, that was in his own hand. And I think it demonstrated the value of the process we ran and the options that we presented to him. Now, he, 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 let, he, you know, he bludgeoned me every day about it after that. You know, he would say, he would say uh, you know, I did X, I did not always Afghanistan. I did, I did this for you, General. And I would say, don't do this for me. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not there. You know, to 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 drive an agenda for for the elected president, because the American people elected the president and the and the vice president. They didn't elect me. I'm not accountable to the American people. So if I try to to make policy on my own, I'm actually, I, you know, I, I'm actually subverting and the, the Constitution of the United States, right? Because because nobody elected me to make policy. The only people who were who are, you know, who are uh, beholden to the, to, to the American people or the president, vice president, of course, the representatives in Congress. Yeah, so it's clear from, from what you've said just now and indeed throughout your book that, the, uh, that a major concern for you was not to repeat the mistakes uh, of Mac Bundy and, and, and others in, in the 60s. And of course, you come back to that in the conclusion. I suppose a critic might say, yes, you gave uh, the president uh, advice he didn't want to hear, but by your very presence as a respected historian and military man, you were giving, these are the critics' words, not necessarily my own, um, uh, cover, as it were, to the president. And so isn't there always a kind of a, a moment where one has to balance that consideration with the consideration of trying to do one's best by one's country uh, and to improve a difficult situation? How, how do you sort of weigh that when, when you're in the position well, you're in? Well, for me, for me, it was my duty to, to serve my country since I was, I was 17, right? I, I took the oath of office uh, at age 17 when I entered West Point. And, and this, might, uh, this might seem unusual to, to, to some people, but I, I never voted, Brendan. I never voted because I followed the, uh, the example of George Marshall, um, you know, who was the architect of victory during, during World War II, served with great distinction across his career. And, uh, and, and because I thought it was extremely important to keep that bold line in place between service in our military and, and partisan politics. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is an American tradition that for our founders went back to the English Civil Wars of the 17th century. And they, they had in mind really Oliver Cromwell when they, when they, when they, they, uh, they made this, you know, this, this, um, you know, this tradition or developed this tradition uh, of, of keeping the military completely out of, out of, uh, you know, out of, out of politics. And, and so, you know, I, I, you know, I, for me, uh, Donald Trump was, you know, the fifth president, I think I'd served uh, under the uh, fifth commander in chief. So for me, it was a, quite an easy decision. Right. And, and, um, uh, you know, I, I never, I never really felt as if, uh, I was asked to, to, uh, to do anything that was unethical or untoward. You know, I, I mean, I, uh, when I took the job, I decided that I would retire out of the job so it, it wasn't like I was going to be angling for, you know, a fourth star or another job in, in the military. I viewed this completely as a bonus round. Mm -hmm. um, and even when I was offered to compete for four star jobs, I turned them all down and let everybody know, the president included, that uh, I was just going to go as, as long, as hard as I could. And when I was when I was done, I was done. So so I think that can be quite liberating. And then it allows you to serve your country. You know, I, I know some people didn't want me to take the job because they wanted Donald Trump to fail. Right. They saw him as such an, an odious person that they wanted him to fail. But, hey, you know, the American people <laughs> elected him <laughs> and and uh, and the stakes are high for the nation uh, if, if a president fails. So, you know, I, I saw it as, as my duty to serve the elected 
you know, president and commander in chief and to do the best job I could. Uh, but, but certainly was never going to be, I was never going to, um, uh, to compromise, you know, my, my principles or, uh, because I think to do so would also be a disservice to the president, right? If I were to do anything, uh, that, that was, um, you know, or didn't present him with information or analysis or recommendations uh, based on, on, on really not having the intestinal fortitude to do it <laughs> or, or, uh, uh, or, or just trying to, uh, you know, to advance an, an agenda uh, that, was, that was partisan or, or you know, that was uh, connected maybe to his, his political uh, objectives. Uh, this was quite early in the administration. I didn't serve during the period of, you know, the, of course, the presidential election and so forth. I imagine the dynamics you know, shifted over time. So I'm going to conclude later uh, with some more questions on history. But before we do that, should we turn to Europe, um, which didn't feature that much uh, in your book, um, which, which I, I take in a way as a compliment. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, inevitably, we are, we're interested and we're getting some uh, uh, audience questions uh, in, in your view of, of the UK and where it should go. As, as you know, we've just had the integrated review on foreign and security policy published. Um, and so we'd we'll be interested in your views on that. Uh, and there's also a specific question uh, from, from Commander Ian Ritchie, who's uh, from the Royal Navy. Uh, and he would like to know that given, given the limitations on the UK's military capacity, where do you think it would be best directed? Yeah. Okay. Well. Well, first of all, I, I really welcome the, the review. I mean, I think it was it was well thought out. I know there have been some criticisms about you know it's it's too aspirational and you know where, where are the resources to be able to 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 be able to implement the strategy. But but you know I, I think that that uh, that the the I, and I believe that 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 the UK is a force for good in the world, right? And and an engaged Britain, the global Britain, is is a force for good. Certainly, I think within Europe to to even you know in in the wake of Brexit to help Europe maybe regain its confidence. I think Brexit was a wake up call maybe for the European Union that the, that uh, that that the uh, you know that the 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 experiment of, of the European Union had had maybe not held true to its to its original conception, and I think uh, that actually the uh, Britain leaving may actually make the EU stronger as as, as a result. Uh, uh, in, in terms of you know curbing maybe ambitions that that had led to this uh, belief of, among you know, uh, many in the UK that you know faceless bureaucrats in Brussels were subverting their their sovereignty and so forth, and and so I, I think Britain will be a force for good in Europe, and I think that'll be a, a primary role. I think that that the UK can also provide, as it always has, a bridge for America into Europe, uh, and and I think the UK. You know, the UK um, relationship with France and Germany is, is extremely important to anchor the US back into the continent. Uh, and, then, and then also maybe to help them resolve their own differences, which after Brexit seem to have come back to the, back to the fore as well. And then also to resolve some of the East, West and North, South issues with it, within the EU. I think the, the UK can be seen as, as a, a country that is, that, that is not, uh, that, that is not, um, doesn't have a stake in some of those disputes and can help mediate them and to help strengthen Europe uh, and, and strengthen Europe against the, the, the common threats that we face. Uh, threats from the South associated with you know, jihadist terrorism, uh, the, the, uh, the second and third order effects of, uh, of you know, the serial, serial episodes of mass homicide that are, are the Syrian civil war and the broader sectarian civil war in the region. You know, really, I think the potential collapse of Afghanistan, which would be tragic, I, I hope that uh, the UK will, will continue to be a strong voice for remaining en engaged there. But then, of course, countering you know, the, the Russian new generation warfare, uh, as well as, as Chinese uh, economic aggression uh, and, 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 its, uh, and its increasing aggression of, of internationally. And I think the UK has been, been ahead of much of Europe in, in each of these areas and can be, can be a strong voice. Uh, I saw the recent uh, policy exchange study uh, on on uh, on on the UK in in the Indo-Pacific region. I think that's very positive as well. Mm -hmm. I think all of us have to recognize you know, that the United States has, of course, some uh, some pretty significant military capacity. But if we don't work together, right? We being the United States, the UK, the EU, Japan. I think now India, Australia, certainly. 
that China will, will play a, divi a divide and conquer, uh, you know, make a divide and conquer effort against us. But if we are together, it's, it's very difficult for, for China to advance its authoritarian mercantilist model at our expense uh, and, and to engage in the range of activities that disadvantage us in connection with the emerging data-driven global economy uh, or, or militarily as well. So anyway, I, I think that the, the UK's role will be, is, is going to be actually be magnified in many ways as a result of Brexit and puts, uh, puts uh, the UK in a, in a position of of uh, of playing really a, a very very important diplomatic as well as as well as as military role. Right at the end of your memoir, uh, you call for the reinvigoration of history teaching uh, at universities um, and also for an understanding of geopolitics. Now, obviously, as an historian um, and a director of a center for geopolitics, I'm delighted to hear that. But I, I wondered, could you just elaborate briefly? Uh, right at the end now, uh, what you had in mind, what you see as the difficulties uh, facing the historical profession in your country and what, what needs to be done about it? Well, I think we, we just, in a large measure, we stopped teaching in many of our, in many of our universities, diplomatic and military history. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's for a number of reasons. One of it was the, the growth of, of, uh, of social history, which is fine. Uh, but so, but the emphasis on social history, I think, grew at the expense of military history. In the United States, it also was a manifestation, I think, uh, or a result of of, uh, of opposition to the Vietnam War, and how in in the academy, uh, those who were who were most against the war tended, uh, I think, to be uh, sympathetic to the new left interpretation of history. And I'm going to really oversimplify, which I shouldn't do as a historian, or certainly not in this, this audience, but, but essentially an interpretation of history that attributes all the ills of the world prior to 1945 to, to colonialism and all of the ills after night of the world after 1945 to, to capitalist imperialism. And, and I think that, that this has been uh, provided, you know, impetus uh, behind um, a call for disengagement from the world, disengagement from foreign, foreign policy, uh, and national security or, or engagement abroad, because this is an interpretation that reinforces the idea that, hey, we're, we're the problem, right? And, and this is what, you know, the, the so-called realist school in the United States, which is really an ideological school of thought. Uh, and, and it's also a, a, uh, a school of thought that portrays itself as fundamentally more modest and humble when it is actually profoundly arrogant because it doesn't acknowledge the agency uh, the influence and the authorship over the future that others have, right? In, 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 the, in, the, in the view of the realist school that is reinforced, I think, by the new left interpretation of, of history, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has no aspirations, uh, but, uh, except in reaction to what we do, you know, or, or it really, uh, Putin has engaged in this sustained campaign of political uh, subversion against us and, you know, and conducted the 2007, you know, <laughs> attacks, the officers attacks on Estonia and invaded Georgia in 2008 and annexed Crimea and invaded Eastern Ukraine because, you know, because we had the temerity to allow democratic countries to join the EU, right? Or, or to join NATO because they wanted to. We should have said no in deference to the Kremlin. We don't think we, we should allow you into, into this club. I mean, so I, I think it's, it's a profoundly arrogant perspective. You know, we caused jihadist terrorism because we had we, we had a presence in, in the Middle East that was offensive, you know, so I, I really think that the best antidote to that is, is his, historical inquiry, because historians tend to reject any sort of orthodoxy or, or theory. And, and, uh, and I think that that's what our undergraduates in particular need more than anything now, because I think in large measure, they're fed this orthodoxy uh, of, of, of really, a, a, you know, a mild form of self-loathing that diminishes our, our, our confidence. And not that we should replace it with kind of a contrived, happy view of our historical record. Of course, we made tremendous mistakes. We had tremendous con contradictions in our systems. You know, our, you know, our, our republic in, in America is, is far from perfect and, and always has been imperfect, but you know, our founders recognized that it, that, that it required constant nurturing. You know? And so I, I, I think that it's time for us to maybe make a concerted effort to regain our confidence to reject these orthodoxies. I think uh, a great example is, is the degree to which academia and, and I think consistent again with this kind of new left interpretation and, 
and the curriculum of self-loathing uh, in, in many of the humanities departments is critical race theory. I mean, critical race theory, I think, uh, you know, teaches, uh, teaches our, our, you know, our undergraduates, now teaches our children in primary and secondary education that they are defined uh, by their identity group, uh, not by the content of their character, not by their soul or their heart or their mind. Uh, they're determined by their identity group, right? And this runs counter, obviously, to what Martin Luther King's aspiration was for, for our country. I mean, he dreamt of a country in, in which people were judged by the content of their character, you know, not, not the color of their skin. I think that's still okay, by the way. But now you get pilloried if you say, you know, that we ought to aspire to colorblindness, you know. Uh, why is that? I think our undergraduates uh, in particular need to really question uh, this orthodoxy they're being fed, because not only is it, I think, uh, you know, fundamentally flawed, uh, but it's also self-destructive. Uh, and, and I think it cuts against our, our common humanity as well. Well, hey, Charles, we've, we've, in a sense, we've only just got going, uh, but <laughs> I'm afraid we actually have to now finish. That's all we have time for. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in uh, to this conversation uh, and for your questions. And I'd like to thank General McMaster very much indeed for speaking to me uh, and for sharing his uh, insights uh, from his time in office. I'd also like to thank the Cambridge Union for collaborating with us, the uh, Center for Geopolitics, and I really enjoyed conducting this interview. I'd like to encourage those uh, uh, who'd like to, to catch coverage of this and any of the union's many events. You can find them all on the Society's YouTube channel. And please do follow uh, the Union and the Center for Geopolitics on Twitter and Facebook for updates. Good night. <laughs>